part of the world where there's been high rates of pneumonia, improved living standards and improved hygiene, which contributes. And then better, better case management, which is what we will discuss today. Because there's a tension between case management that reduces death and case management that reduces the risk of antimicrobial resistance within the community. So this is a, a good picture. We're on the right track. There's um, new vaccines in the pipeline, which we will briefly discuss. But then COVID hit. And COVID obviously caused major disruption all around the world. And you're all familiar with COVID no, and the coronavirus, the most recent SARS coronavirus, having had previous antecedents. So there's four coronaviruses that's been circulating in humans for, for decades already. Then we've had MERS and SARS, but then um, SARS-CoV-2 is the one that, that came to stay. And um, we, we're still living through some of the scars and we'll live with it for quite some while to come. I just want to give you a, an overview of our current understanding of um, COVID transmission. <clears throat> you will know that when COVID started, um, the official line was really that it's not transmitted through the air. It's not respiratory transmitted, it's droplet transmitted. We now know that it's transmitted by both aerosol and droplets. The importance of that is that um, you know, wearing a mask protects us. If you're the person coughing, a, a simple surgical mask will do. If you're the person who wants to protect yourself, an N95 mask is the best. But if both people wear surgical masks, it still offers good protection. But unlike tuberculosis or um, chickenpox or measles that are airborne, purely airborne, um, we know that um, SARS the main route of transmission still remains droplet. So hand hygiene remains as important as always. The other big difference between tuberculosis, for instance, which is an area of interest for me, and SARS, is that SARS can infect you the moment it touches any of your mucous membranes. Tuberculosis, you have to inhale deep into your lung, which makes it far easier to infect a new person. One of the major impacts of um, COVID has been that it disrupted the normal viruses that circulate in our population. And this is just some data from Australia, but I think you've had similar experiences here in Vietnam, and we can discuss that in a minute. But if you look at the, um, the trend line here, this is what we normally see with RSV, for instance, um, in Australia before COVID came. Um, then, during the first period of COVID, essentially RSV disappeared. Um, but when social restrictions were lifted, we had this unusual high peak of RSV in different parts of Australia. So this is in New South Wales, in Western Australia, Victoria. It's a big country. All over the country, we had these RSV outbreaks. At an unusual time of the year, you can see it's different to what the normal seasonal pattern is and at far higher rates than what we've ever seen before. Uh, when we looked at the genomics of this, um, not sure why, why that. Um, when we looked at the genomics of this, you don't have to worry in detail about the figure. I won't try and take that away. Um, but what is interesting is to, to note that if you look at the blue here at the bottom, just see if I can get my pointer there, but at the bottom, those sections with the blue, that is what happened to RSV virus after COVID. So essentially in the past, RSV in Australia was introduced from all over the world and there were multiple strains of RSV circulating in the country. But when COVID came and we had social restrictions, suddenly the RSV circulating in Western Australia, was the yellow was completely different from the RSV circulating on the East Coast. So we were, the, the, the viruses became separate and isolated and evolved sep separately. But now that we've opened the borders again, those viruses are mixing. So why is it that children post-COVID seems to have more severe viral infection? And you may have about heard about this concept of immunity debt. So immunity debt is the, the idea, and it's, um, it's not yet been proven, but it's currently the working hypothesis that because of these unprecedented restrictions that we had during COVID, common respiratory viruses stopped circulating. And that meant 
that children were no longer exposed to these viruses. But when we relaxed the COVID restrictions, the viruses started circulating again. But now children have not been exposed to those viruses for one or two years and haven't had the, Im the regular immune exposure and immune stimulation. And that, that is where the immune debt concept comes from. Like I've shown you with RSV, children were suddenly getting RSV at a different time of the year, and children with RSV now have not had any exposure in the, in the previous two years, and which is why we think the disease severity is worse. Um, in Vietnam, um, I think the similar experience you've had with adenovirus, I know it's still, still being investigated, but um, the, the outbreak of severe respiratory virus infections in, in Hanoi seems to be driven by an adenovirus infection that, that may have a similar basis, that children have had a decreased exposure in the past, in the, in the recent past. So I want to emphasize that viral infections are the most common cause of pneumonia and RSV, the single biggest pathogen, um, because we, we often think of pneumonia as purely bacterial and our treatment obviously only addresses bacterial infections. Um, our tools at the moment are very limited. A chest x-ray we know from multiple studies now is not sufficiently specific to give us a clear distinction between viral and bacterial disease. Multiplex PCR is something that most countries in the world are now using. So where you just do a nasopharyngeal aspirate and are able to do um, a whole array of viral tests. Um, in Vietnam, the argument has always been that the, the added value of doing a multiplex PCR is limited. Uh, and it's true, it doesn't always influence the clinical management, but we know what it does do is it gives you a very good idea of what are the viruses circulating in your community. And it also influences the way doctors and pediatricians think about antibiotic treatment. If you know what are the current circulating viruses and, uh, and have confirmed a viral infection in a child. So th there's ongoing discussions in many parts of the world. How do we upscale access to these multiplex PCR tests? for viral studies, especially post-COVID, where we now realize how important it is. One of the good things of the COVID epidemic, if we have to reflect on that, is the spectacular success of the mRNA vaccines. And um, you may know that RSV vaccine, there's a very promising RSV vaccine that's now in phase three trials. Because of the, the trends that I've shown you, where children now have less, a, a decrease in pneumonia compared to older adults, this RSV vaccine will first be tested in older adults and then in children, but it's due to start uh, this or, uh, early in 2023. And you may also have heard of CEPI, which is a, a global initiative to develop vaccines against new emerging infections. Um, they now have a whole array of emerging pathogens against which vaccines are developed. And these vaccines are developed in preparation for potential future outbreaks. So we are moving into a whole new era of prevention and rapid response. Unfortunately, it's not with us as yet, but that is one of the positive outcomes of the, the COVID epidemic. So let me just quickly move on to the, the diversity of um, pathogens that, that cause bacterial pneumonia. Now, in many countries of the world, we've got a poor handle on exactly what are the organisms, but the, the most extensive study that's been done was the PERCH study, which included seven countries, including two Asian countries, that have shown that there's a huge variety of bacteria causing infections in different parts of the world. Um, but an interesting observation was that in most of these countries, TB was identified in 5 to 10 percent of children with severe pneumonia presenting to hospital. And I just included a chest x-ray of a child with proven TB to show that in settings where there's high rates of tuberculosis, um, TB can present like common childhood pneumonia. And it's important for us on the x-ray, at least, to be aware that this could be a TB presentation, especially if these children are not acutely ill. If that was any of the other bacteria, we know that a child with an x-ray like this would probably have been um, 
in the ICU or acutely ill, but if this child does not have acute symptoms, please think of tuberculosis. I mentioned tuberculosis um, because child TB is one of the areas um, that globally we are becoming more aware of its huge disease burden. And there was a recent updated WHO consolidated guidelines that were released, and um, this is all accessible online. The other valuable resource is the new chest x-ray atlas, um, which is available online, which gives you the whole overview of the different spectrum of um, TB disease in children. And I know that Expert Ultra is available now in, in Vietnam with greater access for children, and at least in the, the referral hospitals where you work, um, that should be readily available and something that you should access. Um, just quickly to move to risk factors for pneumonia, because of the, the global overview that I showed you that was published in the Lancet have shown that the risk factors, even though pneumonia incidents have changed, haven't changed over the past uh, 20 years. The main risk factors that remain a major concern um, in, in Vietnam include malnutrition and in and outdoor air pollution, as well as um, the absence of breastfeeding in, in some parts of the country. And I'll just quickly present a, an overview of the risk factors um, comparing Vietnam to other countries in the region, which was part of Fung's PhD work. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly mention some of her work during the Vietnam Focus now. Um, but you can see that breastfeeding is the one area where there's um, increased, uh, or where there's low uptake in many parts of the country, but we know in many baby-friendly hospitals, breastfeeding uptake is now increasing in, in Vietnam. And then clearly smoking among adults, which exposes children, is something we all worry about. So just to touch on the pneumonia disease burden in, in the um, different parts of the healthcare system in Vietnam. You, you're all aware that maybe it's the admissions to hospital, um, that pneumonia is a single, or up, upper respiratory tract infections is a single biggest contributor. And this is especially true at district hospital level. And um, what I want to focus on in the first column is just if you, can s if you see that many of the children admitted to our district hospitals only have upper respiratory symptoms, don't have lower respiratory tract symptoms. And the big challenge is how do we keep those children out of hospital to prevent them from getting secondary infections and unnecessary antibiotics. The tertiary hospitals, like the um, National Children's Hospital in, in Hanoi, you can see, see more younger children and they see more severe, uh, the more severe end of the disease spectrum. Um, the challenge though is how can we identify those children with unlikely pneumonia or no pneumonia and keep them out of hospital? So this is a 12-month prospective study that looked at more than 4,000 children admitted to Da Nang, um, um, Hospital for Women and, and Children. And you can see that of all the children admitted with pneumonia during that 12-month period, a very large number did not meet WHO criteria for pneumonia. These children had respiratory symptoms, but didn't meet a strict criteria for tachypnea and, 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 in, and chest indrawing. In an ideal world, these are the children that we want to keep out of hospital to prevent them from um, getting secondary infection in hospital um, and to, to manage at home. Management in the hospital, um, and, and you will know, I would love to hear your opinion, what is the experience in your hospital, but the experience in, in Da Nang and, and in the local district hospitals is that broad spectrum antibiotics are frequently used as first line medicine. Um, Patients are usually treated for five to seven days with IV antibiotics, and that course of treatment is completed, um, irrespective of the symptomatic improvement, and that step down to oral antibiotics is very rarely implemented. So that, those are things but as, which, as clinicians, I think we can all think about how can we um, reduce the um, inpatient stay and switch to oral antibiotics as soon as possible when the child is stable. The dilemma clearly is that pneumonia remains a major cause of disease and death, like we've said. Um, we've seen that there's declining rates, but we know that optimal case management and use of antibiotics... Uh, 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 uh,
và chúng tôi đưa ra cái khuyến cáo nếu bệnh nhân tim mạch có thể đo đa ký hô hấp thì chúng ta có thể in Vietnam showing that CRP gives us a very good discrimination between likely and unlikely bacterial infection. And to close off, I just want to focus on the final interpretation of the, the, the data from Da Nang that looked at how can we identify children with unlikely pneumonia and focus on keeping them out of hospital and minimizing their antibiotic exposure, using CRP as the guide. Um, so. This study looked at predictors of unlikely, bac unlikely bacterial pneumonia, so not looking at pneumonia. And you can see that the, the core predictor predictors um, are those that we can readily use in clinical practice, which includes you know, temperature, chest x-ray picture, and um, re respiratory distress. Bone. Correct. Um, how do we put all of that together in a practical clinical approach to reducing um, antibiotics? This is the suggestion, um, which um, probably requires prospective testing. But we know that um, this is in accordance with current WHO guidelines and um, offers the prospect of, of, of reducing antibiotic use um, in, 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 in many of the district hospital settings in Vietnam. Maybe just quickly to touch on... No, The core, the core part of this which will reduce um, unnecessary antibiotic use is to identify children who have a wheezy chest uh, or a runny nose without fever. I think a core message is that those children do not need admission and don't need antibiotics, which is currently happening in many of the district hospitals. And for those children um, who have a fever, that CRP is the most important determinant to give us a clue whether antibiotics would have any clinical use or not. Um, so, sorry, if I know we are pressed for time, but I'll just conclude by saying um, global pneumonia deaths are declining, but it remains the number one killer in young children. Um, COVID has complicated the picture that, like I've shown you with RSV and with adenovirus. And the most likely explanation is that this is due to the immune debt created during the disruption of respiratory virus circulation. Um, Appropriate antibiotic use is important to reduce pneumonia deaths, um, but its inappropriate use fuels um, drug resistance. And I hope that the algorithm that we briefly touched on um, gives you an, an indication that it is possible to have um, you know, a more rational approach to antibiotic use, at least in the lower levels of the healthcare system where more uncomplicated cases present for, for treatment. Thank you. I'll stop.